Hello everyone and welcome back to the Hyper Friends. You maybe already watched the big video about uh, doing bomb and hardware reviews that I did together with Steve. To make it a bit easier, uh, we decided to split up the one hour video in a few smaller ones so that you can concentrate on the parts you may want to rewatch or want to uh, want to look again. So enjoy the short video coming about the hardware reviews and what we're thinking and yeah, leave us comments leave us um like subscribe our channel i said if you have questions just comment below write us on linkedin or if you're working with us as a team already just ping us directly so have a great one enjoy and thank you So the, the next area I think we're going to look into is the storage. So I just bring the um, so so again the one of the first things we look for are that that normally maybe what, we can yep. uh, in storage we have a lot of text so maybe we can zoom in a bit so that yep. the audience can see that a bit better. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay. So yeah, so the first round, first part is around the storage controller. So the, the, what you need to do is you um, your storage control controller can't be in a um, uh, sort of dual state. So a lot of now a lot of modern storage controllers you can have some ports which are, um, are part of the controller which allows you to have a RAID configuration, and then the other part is just a J board, just a normal a bunch of disks. The you the disks which are passed through for storage spaces direct can't have any sort of RAID um, configuration on them. But what you would probably be looking to do is have a, a, a mirrored pair of disks for your operating system. So if you have a disk failure, your operating system is still going to survive that. So again, so what we look for is to look for that separate controller. So you have a set one controller, which would be for your operating system disks, but you would have a mirrored pair. And then the, the second rate control, storage controller would just pass the disks through. It doesn't need any RAID capabilities or functionality because all of that is handled at a um, at a, a, a operating system level in the software. So what we what we basically have here for the for the operating system, we have a classic RAID. Yep. And normally most modern motherboards from the from the vendors already have those RAID controllers on chip. So uh, in most configurations, you don't need to need to have an extra one. Um, and then you will have the additional HBAs, which provide you with the with with the lanes for your uh, for your disk uh, disk or in this normally you we're seeing a lot of NVMEs or SSDs or flash uh, stuff. We will also talk about hi, uh, hybrid storage configuration versus full flash uh, in a few minutes, I think. Yeah. Um, but it's that's what that's what we normally see. We see one dedicated controller as an HBA for for disk management of your storage pool, for the for the software defined storage, and then having a classic rate controller, I would say, handling the two uh, flash or disks devices for your operating system. Yep. Yes. So again, the, the next step we look at is, as as Flo just mentioned, the you do have the option of going for a hybrid storage configuration. So again, hi, hybrid would be if you have two types of uh, of storage, uh, so S, SSD or NVMe. But one thing that that you need to sort of remember is that if you're uh, if you just have uh, traditional hard disk spinning disks, you have to have a cache level, whether that be SSD or NVMe. You can't just have uh, traditional hard disks as being your entire storage system. So, so it, again, if you go down, if you uh, if you do have traditional hard disks in your storage solution, part of your solution, you need to make sure you've got either SSD or NVMe disks to be part of that cache level. And again, if you don't have those, again, um, you, you you would need to speak to the hardware OEM to to, to get that um, to get that done. 
Um, and then I, I think if we I can't remember if we covered just, um, yep. Yeah, just just moving back to and there will be additional video about hybrid versus uh, full flash configuration. But when we're looking on those bombs, our considerations again here, what workload do we run? Yeah. Um, normally what what we encountered is hybrid configuration is particularly pretty slow, especially if you if, if you're running out of cache here. So what we th think or what we encountered in a hybrid configuration, it's good for classic things like file servers, backup stuff, or archiving. Because there you have a lot of cold data. Those cold data will be moved to the spinning disk. So it will just laying around there, uh, write once, read never, basically. But if we have active configurations, like we are running Kubernetes, we are running a Azure Virtual Desktop, we are running uh, application servers, we are running databases, we have all active disks. And in those cases, it's a better choice to move to SSD plus NVMe or a full flash SSD or NVMe array um, for performance and also reliability. So if those NVMe's or SSDs survive much longer than even enterprise disk. And also it, they don't have the high bottleneck with, with the SATA interfaces because especially the NVMe's have their dedicated PCI lanes or PCI lane expanders. Um, which gives them a much higher performance. And it's really also depending on your workload. If you have more idle, more cold workload, hybrid may, may be fine. If you're really working actively, being hot, running as a containers or, or other demanding uh, applications and, and services, just go for full flash. Yeah. I, I must admit the majority of customers I work with, they, they are looking at full flash. Um, and, and again, it's, it's for those reasons that the, the, they need that performance and also they don't know what's, what's coming down the line. Um, but uh, as we, we go, the, when you, so, so what you can actually do is you can still have a hybrid storage system, but use SSD and NVMe as Flo mentioned, so you could have SSD as being your capacity disks and the NVMe as being your cache to give you that even sort of, um, um, let's say, supercharged performance so that you get the, the fast from the NVMe, but you don't have to commit to NVMe for your entire storage system. So one of the things that we look for is that the, the number of capacity disks should be a multiple of the number of cache disks. And that's to allow for a consistent balance across the um, uh, across across the the nodes and, and all of the disks. So if you um, if you have four cache disks, you go for for four, eight, twelve, sixteen capacity disks, so that that each um, each each cache disk has. The, an equal amount of capacity disks, so you can get more of a consistent, um, a, a consistent performance. Another thing that, when it comes to the cache that we look for, is trying to have at least a ten percent of your cache to be at least ten percent of your capacity. So, um, so again, it's again, so you can get the most from your. Um, from from the cache tier because the last thing you want is your cache tier to keep on filling up too quickly because then you start to lose the 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 benefit of that. Um, so again, we just look to try to to sort of roughly work out that it, it's more than a 10 percent cache uh, compared to the of the capacity total. Um, <clears throat> I, I think. One of the things around the storage, I think we, we alluded to, and uh, I don't think it's included on this one, is <clears throat> that making sure that based on the resiliency level that you're going to have, that you have enough capacity disks. So one of the one of the key recommendations, uh, and I, I alluded to it here, is um, to have one reserve disk per node of your capacity disks and what this would allow is it, it means that if you're running operating as normal and you get a capacity disk that fails 
storage spaces direct has the the space available to re reinstigate the the resiliency level that you require so if you have a three way mirror uh, and you lose a disk storage and there's a reserve disk in place the storage spaces direct will start to use that space move data around when, via storage jobs so that your any volumes which are Im, impacted by that disk being lost or uh, uh, in the process of being um, being put back to a three-way mirror. So there's three copies of that data. And that allows you to then, um, and maybe the next day that you get a replacement disk, and when you insert that disk, what will happen is that um, an optimization job will run over the next sort of couple of days, which will then balance all of the data out again onto those disks. But what it means, it means that you're not sitting with volumes um, and, and not optimal resiliency level whilst you're waiting for a replacement disk. Um, yep. yep. And uh, especially with a replacement disk. So I, I had that with a, with a customer. Um, you can something equal take equal from the from the shelf shelf either same same size or larger. But what you should do is wipe it before you put it into the array. So yes. we had the customer taking a spare disk from his shelf, putting it in the array, but someone puts already some data on. Um, software the storage spaces direct will not take the disk because uh, it's not deleting the disk because it's thinking that it could be a spare disk. It needs to know that it is a spare disk, and that's and and to know that or to re-identify that as a spare disk, it must be wiped completely, wiped, empty, no no file system, nothing on it. And then it would take it and put it in the storage pool. Yeah. So, so again, with that, if, if you, it's recommended to have at least one reserve, but I think within the documentation mentions to go up to four reserves, reserve disks. And again, that's just to, to allow your system to be as optimal as possible. Um, most customers I work with have just go for a single reserve disk because they've normally got a, a four, a four hour or next day turnaround time on replacement hardware and they're, they're quite content to to wait that four hours or that uh or to the next day for a replacement disk or, um, or, or just uh, do one thing have a cold spare sitting on top of your rack as yeah. we, as we did in in the past just have a spare one and just plug it in that gives you another another option yep so again i i think i think the next bit um I think again we alluded earlier about about scaling, so um, that is is it is it possible that you're only going to want to scale storage, and normally that is the requirement that you yep. that that that's that's, the ninety percent of all scale scenarios yeah. we have is I need to have more storage, yeah, not because, more more CPU or more memory capacities really give me more storage. Yeah, because I I think at the moment. Data is king, and and people are just gathering more and more data. And I think part of that's been the cost of storage just came down, so people have been. Oh, we all been data less... hoarders. Yes, yes, that's it. Um, <laughs> so there's, I'm, I'm sure there's legislations out there that stop some of that, but th yeah, that's not for us to cover. But but yes, yeah, so so what you need to look at is, do you have any free slots? Um, is is it worthwhile? maybe uh keeping a couple of spare disk slots per per node is available for for that sort of last minute uh, uh expansion but I, one thing that you you do need to remember is that if you if you have six six spare spare five slots and you've got you put in six 10 terabyte disks if you've got a three way mirror that's only really going to give you 20 terabytes of usable right. Storage because your three-way room with your copies. That that's another thing that um, that uh, I've spoken with a couple of customers about is that adding additional disks just because you add an extra sixty terabytes of storage, you don't. That's then not usable because if if it's a two-way mirror, you'll get around 30, 30 terabytes of usable. But if you if it's three-way mirror, again, it's going to be um, you would only get that extra. 20 terabytes of storage, which is still still considerable. But again, it's something just to consider because if you've got no slots, as as Flo's mentioned, you would need to buy a new a new yep. server. 
and it needs to be matching. It needs to be all symmetrical. Is that hardware available? Is as does your switch design allow for easily additional addition of a of a node? But then also you've got because you're adding an extra node means you're uh, you're adding extra cores, and as just like HCI is built on a core basis. So adding that extra is going to increase the the, the licensing cost of the uh, of the entire cluster. Um, so, yep. so but so, personal personal yep. recommendation here from our team is really go for the largest backplane you can have. Yes. So normally all these uh, these chassis come with different flavors. So for the Dell R60 series, I think you have four, eight, twelve something like that backplanes and for the larger ones even up to 24 or 26 uh, so we really go for the largest backplane you can have it may be an uptick from a few a few hundred bucks maybe um, but on the long term it gives you so much more expansion space and as steve said it saves so many costs because adding another server getting more switch ports getting the cables uh, it's Getting more running costs with with the licenses and and an ACR you will produce with another system. It's it, it's just 100 times or even more expensive than go for the back big backplane and more and and more uh, lane capacity than in, uh, than yeah. So just buy the, the larger backplane and more lanes in the first place to save some money at the end. So I so. Hey everyone, thank you for watching that video. And uh, if you liked it, subscribe our channel, there will be more. And yeah, leave us comments with questions, uh, topic, topics you want to see. And yeah, enjoy your time. Thank you so much. Bye.